so good evening ladies and gentlemen and wish you a happy independence day the topic of today is pathare prabhu the history art culture and heritage and being a pathare prabhu i feel very proud for being invited here to speak on my community the pathare prabhus are one of the early settlers in the sense that they are early immigrants to the island of bombay at which point of time their islands were seven and the pathare prabhus are supposed to have come from marwad rajputana gujarat devgiri and finally to mumbai bombay now there have been lot of books there have been lot of write up on the history of the pathare prabhus quite a bit of them were conflicting so ultimately i decided that whenever i prepare a talk or a ultimately a copy table book i will go by what has been accepted by the university what i mean is that a member of the pathare prabhu community vasan rao he he tendered a doctoral thesis in 1945 to bombay university pathare prabhu of bombay and got a phd trace the history and i will go by that route to conflicting historical facts there is a map of bombay with seven islands uh you can see bandra at the top from where it appears that raja bimba of ramdev rai of devgiri he came from devgiri along with his uh, troops and four communities pathare prabhu saukarshi brahmins and saukarshi brahmins uh, saukarshi patskarshi and brahmins they all came on the island of mahi bandra and they set up uh, raja bimba settled there at which point of time it was called maikavati establish a temple of his patron goddess which is in today's context would be prabha devi temple on the neighboring island on the right and mahi island he actually set up a law court quite unusual for that period to have a law court immediately after now after that was done he died on 1303 now pratap shah did not do much no idea whether he continued the court we don't know but he shifted his capital from kavati to marol thereafter himself slain by his own brother in law gurudev chief of cheul and is by him eventually eight sultan of gujarat defeated nagardev and actually killed him. and he obtained bombay and salset islands and they went to to sultan of gujarat now sultan of gujarat did hardly anything on the islands except establish darga which is the baba magdun darba at mahim if you this and uh, nothing was done the islands because they never thought that bombay island capable of new or anything could be done this seven islands remain seven islands in 1534 the portuguese defeated gujarat and ultimately out of a settlement the islands the portuguese basically like other european power had come to india for spices and sanity they found that the populate the population on bombay island was basically initially hindus and there are uh, during golden period some mohammedans they were so meek that they thought that first let us start with converting them to christianity and to spices part in the process the portuguese started secreting and demolishing the temple deities of the hindus after the incident took place around 560 when the prabhat of goddess prabhavati which was set up by uh, bimbara that was so that was likely to be desecrated the owners of the temple removed the idols temple not only of uh, a prabhavati but there were other idols also. all removed and immersed in a nearby well and they ran that the idols don't are not desecrated after they went away italy considered the islands of bombay to because portugal was expecting an attack by sun in uh, europe mr. and they Jaiker, wanted military help mr jaikar should not affection so they had to make some uh, arrangement by right? a part of the dowry which was given Mr. Jaikar, the second, the king of England. Jaikar, can I intervene, please? Of 
your voice in front of Catherine of Braganza, the king, in 1661. Yeah, and subsequently, and subsequently in 1662, the marriage in the, hello, uh, the marriage so place in London. Your voice is breaking in between. So if you after can, the yeah. islands came to the British, yeah, they they found it difficult to maintain them because their head of was about six thousand miles away. So even that East India Company, who had already started business on the West coast, and particularly with headquarters at Surat, they made an offer that please give us these islands, and we will on a lease, and we will pay you ten pounds as a rent. rent. The British thought it was good riddance to Babish, and they handed it to East India Company, who at that point in time were only at they had no intention of ruling or anything, but their chart which East India Company was created, as also the Ivies, the lease was created in 1668. Both, in case they wanted to uh, establish a law court and establish the law, they could do that on the island of Bombay. East India Company got the possession from the British in 68. Second governor of East India Company, Gerard Ongier, uh, of great enterprise, he decided that I'm going to develop as a port city because he, he thought that, that the port of Bombay was the best port ever east of Cape of Good Hope. So he decided that he was going to and for making it into a port city, he decided this of seven islands is not good. They should be all united into one particular piece of mass of land. And he started doing this. Finally, Gerald Angier did not last long. He died in 1670. But one of the things he had set up in motion was of the Bombay Islands. Now, Bombay Islands were located in such a way at the time of low tide, one could cross one island to the other. The gap, the breach between the main Bombay Island to Worli, which is, uh, say, I would say around that, time, that place, that is the place from where the sea came inside. So, ultimately, that particular breach had to be filled up. The island, seven islands could become one. By 17, the governor was Hanbi Velard, uh, Hanbi. Uh, and he do that breaching, complete the breach. East India Company to not to waste money because there anyway uh, uh, could be accessed by a certain. But he decided that in spite of East India Company denial, he would make up the breach and he asked the Bombay citizens to contribute. Now every time that one wall was sought to be put, the <coughs> wall would collapse. So, what happened was that the three goddess, Mahalakshmi, Ma Saraswati, came into the dream of the contractor who was doing that, a separate contractor named Ramji Shivji. Now, Ramji Shivji got a dream that if you remove these idols and set up in a it will be done. He precisely did that and the work was done. See, just before, about 60 years before, 17, 8 year olds, the, there was another dream. So I think Patare uh, blessed with a lot of good dreams that in seven dream in the uh, for, uh, which came to the owners of the Pramadi who had already gone out of Mumbai that now no chance of the desecration. Please remove us a well and into the time from where they were removed and ultimately that one. So immediately those and Prabhadevi temple uh, was started functioning. And Dakuna, who was uh, a prolific Bombay, in his origin of Bombay, he quotes, he Patare Prabhu is actually where the where the descendant himself. And he said that Patare Prabhu is with them, much bureaucratic skill and some culture of Mr. Jaikar, of Bombay. Mr. So he's Jaikar, talking about the Patare Prabhu's culture. Actually onwards. Mr. So when Jaikar. we talk culture, and what culture is. It is a refined lifestyle in of residence in Bombay from birth to death in an opulent manner. Now this is the way how the Patare Prabhu's lifestyle to Bombay. Now here are two illustrations uh, which, are, which are done by a very prolific artist M. V. Durandar about whom we will come a little later. A work on Patare Prabhu culture and how the Patare Prabhu's lived and how and on the top left, you see the family of 
joint family they have setting the bali pratipada new uh, who was uh, sent to patal by vishnu during his vaman avatar uh, was a very benevolent king and he looked after his uh, praja very well so patal prabhu feel that bali raja at some point of time should come out of patal and start ruling us i wish he can come now and also take care of the covid which is which is happening in all over world so every year that bali puja bali puja is done on the diwali day in the fond hope that he will come till 2020 he has not appeared but we hope that he should come sometime the second one on the right bottom is bhaubis this is a very traditional way where a sister is doing the aarti to the brothers and brothers as part of their uh, their contribution they give something to the sister in terms of money or some gifts and at the same time they vow that they will look after the sister now next slide is a typical slide of on picture postcards now picture postcards started in bombay in around 1898 and this is these are the the british photographers who wanted to send back pictures to their uh, counterparts their families etc as to how the life was in bombay they have they have made two photographs of patare prabhu ladies the one who is on the top is quite relaxing and appears to be from a very affluent family and uh, the other one appears to be from a middle class family about to go to the temple so they are dressed in such a way that uh, that the other communities whenever the ladies dressed up they always ask each other do i look like a parbin parbin means a patare prabhu lady and that was the standard which was set by the patare prabhus then of course the patare prabhu dress the pagdi etc started shrinking and now we have another illustration by durandar in one of the books which was in 1944 and this is around the time of independence how the patare prabhu look the lady is very graceful she is wearing flowers she has got a sari she is taking a shela on the top and the patare prabhu is dressed in his dagla and the pagdi now let us see how the patare prabhu women at that time looked again a durandar a uh, durandar's picture a very famous uh, oil on canvas and he had got uh, even a uh, prizes for this kind for this particular picture you will notice that there are so many ladies in the picture every face is different you will also notice that there is a small girl who is being attended probably by her mother she is wearing tall shoes and the other ladies you can see their blouses you can see the hairdo the way they have put the flowers in their this and the bride is talking to one of her probably a sister or a friend and the whole picture gives an atmosphere that that there is a very active session going on probably just before the marriage now let us say now in around 1908 there was a small exhibition held by uh, daivadnya community in bombay and it was attended by quite a few patare prabhus it was a small exhibition of art and craft of uh, in bombay and while that was being attended to some of the members of the community thought that since the patare prabhu men and women are so uh, well versed in art and craft why don't we have a exhibition of our own and that to on a very large scale and that thought was entertained because patare prabhu as we will as we go along we will see that they were not actually good in business they were all professionals they were good in art they were good in maintaining their lifestyle their culture etc so they thought that by having a exhibition of art craft art and craft the patare prabhu themselves will get an idea about the response that they get and then they can venture into some business activity by selling their art or or creating art for others so this exhibition was held in a school called chandaram ji high school which was just opened about a couple of years before and the exhibition was opened by gopal krishna gokhale on 28th of november there were 125 male and 46 female volunteers 1600 exhibits from the community whose population at that time was only 4000 people from 400 families every day there were around 3 3000 citizens of bombay who visited the exhibition and on 11th of december uh, 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 which concluded on 11th of december on 2nd december 1909 the governor of bombay visited the exhibition and appreciated the whole effort the exhibition as an entrance fee of princely sum of 2 annas and before the exhibition was conceptualized 
the committee which was formed for doing this exhibition they decided that we are going to have this exhibition divided into three parts one part will be drawing painting and subject related to fine art second will be needlework stitching embroidery in which all the ladies were very accomplished and third will be chemicals and health related products so these were the three different things now let us see that in the first section what are the different categories which come in now the condition for this particular exhibition was that before the applicant submitted his exhibit he had to give an undertaking that the exhibit is made by him and it was not somebody else's work or or procured from somewhere so he had to give that undertaking and for which four months was given before the commencement of the exhibition for everybody to be ready with all their products and uh, exhibits so there were drawing and painting different categories in that then there was sculpture on different surface plaster clay wood metal etc then there were engravings again done by the patai prabhus on wood stone and metal photography different kinds of uh, there were there also sub divisions landscape portraits etc then there was architecture where architectural designs of houses chawls bungalows done by the patai prabhu architects machine design tracing work etc then there was a gauri then there were three uh, putts putts means these are designs which were used at the time of uh, three pujas the gauri puja the pitori puja and what a savitri puja so i have just as a demonstration i am showing the gauri putt how it is done in a very uh, <coughs> in a very uh, colorful and a very artistic manner so that entire all the implements that are shown are household implements and there is a blessing from the goddess so that this is a gauri putt which stand behind gauri is the mother of ganesha on the third day of uh, ganesh festival the gauri is supposed to be brought by some of the patai prabhus in their house it's a balsam plant which is brought there and the uh, and the story behind is that a balsam plant only flourishes for 3 days so a gauri when she comes back to her to her uh, maternal home uh, she has to stay there for 3 days the first day she comes second day she meets everybody and the third day she has to leave so that is the concept of the gauri and for celebrating is this particular design is used now we have calligraphy the different samples of calligraphy in marathi modi english rangoli designs to which we are going to come rangoli was one of the art which was specialized by the patari prabhu ladies and in a big way now any other this is a residual residual thing that any other work which is not covered of art is also uh, in that particular section ladies and girls had a separate category and particularly the girls below the age of 16 then we come to the second section well there is needle work now before i checked up this i was also not aware that needle work in itself had so many uh, different uh, sub divisions of different type of work including if you see j rafu work rafu work means actually you are repairing something which is torn and the patchwork then there is stitching by hand and machine everything there then we have embroidery again embroidery of different type japanese crochet delhi embroidery surat embroidery etc ribbon work then there is seed and bead work different on different surfaces satin grass etc then we have the culinary art and a, a, a very prominent lady of our community also we are going to come to that so these are the artifacts these are the, in within the four months that to do the jams and papads and pickles and everything and that was also form also part as an exhibit now chemically manufactured soap candles ink etc then homemade medicine that also with with a little caption given to it as to when it is to be taken how it is to be taken what are the ingredients so with this kind of a section now let us have a little look at the exhibition itself now unfortunately this uh, these pictures which are taken are from a magazine called prabhu masik which the prabhu masik was started in 1906 the printing is slightly poor and over a period of time it has also deteriorated but you can see a little bit of it that we are right now looking at the section where the clothes etc are being shown the next one is again there are certain photo frame there are artifacts etc this is how it was shown in the chandaramji high school then we have a complete section for embroidery stitching and all that and you will see little labels being put up also for every exhibit then we have the the one on the left hand side is the rangoli section which is a rangoli on water we are going to deal, deal with it a little later then there are certain artworks like portraits uh, paintings etc which are also there 
then now we are coming to the rangoli now this is the rangoli which is of uh, a goddess on the lion which had uh, which won the prize therefore that was prominently shown in that tabu masik then <clears throat> there are other artifacts which are also shown uh, divan khana is the living room of that particular uh, school which was a, initially a resident and then converted into a school then there is a picture out just outside the school of the managing committee look at the number of people who are the, on the managing committee to manage this kind of an exhibition some of them uh, the juniors are you can see them standing in the in the balcony above then again there is there are swayam sevak that is the volunteers the number of volunteers which were there obviously all the men are sitting down and the ladies are again in the in the uh, terrace above so this is the kind of exhibition which was done then at the end of the exhibition uh, this is the certificate which was issued both to the volunteers as well as to the participants and this certificate itself the design was again there was a competition there were five designs which were shortlisted and in, and eventually this particular design was selected you see all the little pictures which are there on the frame of the design they all talk about what was happening in the exhibition now <clears throat> after seeing this exhibition the governor of bombay uh, the office of the governor of bombay informed the patare prabhus that look in 1911 there is going to be uh, the king george the 5th and queen mary are going to visit bombay they are going to be there in bombay for 2 3 days and there is going to be an exhibition of uh, old bombay to be organized by the government since your ladies are so prolific in uh, doing the rangolis why don't you book a pavilion for showing different type of rangolis on the surface above water below water so eventually so this is a picture of uh, near gateway of india where gateway of india is now situated you can see a plaster of paris structure which was temporarily uh, put up through which king george the 5th and queen mary came down came out and on the in the second picture below you will see there is a little wooden pavilion where the king and the queen are sitting and there is firoz shah mehta the president of the bombay municipal corporation then is making a, a welcome address so this is how they entered bombay in uh, december of 2011 now in order to show them there was a children's fete which is on the top where all the children are singing songs etc and uh, and their uh, uh, majesties were present this is the, on the bottom is a section of the uh, boundary or the circumference of the exhibition which is shown coming to the next is the main exhibition where being a exhibition of old bombay uh, you will see from the, at the back of the exhibition you will see it is at azad maidan because you can clearly see victoria terminus and uh, the municipal head office and these are some of the structures which were there as pavilions for holding artifacts now there is on the on the right hand side below there is a there you will see that there is a wide structure with a dome now that is the cornwallis monument which was there originally in the in on the bombay green which subsequently after it was made into a garden it became elphiston circle and subsequently became honiman circle so in the process of making elphiston circle that particular thing was removed just in front of that you will see that there are there is a small structure in probably in black stone that was the church gate now original church gate was located somewhere near flora fountain where exists today and that was the church gate now apart from that if we go to the next slide which is a little uh, enlarged version you see the church gate very carefully and there is a little balloon which was a novelty at that time then there is a uh, the exhibition uh, the exhibition uh, area is there which is just on the right hand side of balloon and there is a singer showroom which has got a little tower on the extreme right now the the arrow which is pointing is the is the pavilion where the patare prabhu women had assembled and did their art work now let us see what was that rangoli thing the special pavilion was located as i shown the location and patare prabhu's women started doing the rangolis from 3rd december that was the opening of the exhibition for 70 consecutive days doing one rangoli would take 4 to 5 hours and about 32 patare prabhu ladies demonstrated their art of rangoli on surface below surface and above water the european muslim christian and parsi ladies were very curious to know so there were any schools which taught this art some of the designs look like oil paintings and you see the picture which is on the left which is a prize winning rangoli where it is shown 
yeah, imaginatively, that Pathari Prabhu women are actually doing Arti to King George V and Queen Mary. And since they have come by the ship, you, are, you can see a little bit of ocean and the ship there. And this is a, and this is a Rangoli, which I would, I would say looks like an oil painting. And the subjects which were selected for this particular Rangoli were mythological Hindu gods, goddesses, saints, flora, fauna, etc. And this particular uh, pavilion was visited by the royal couple. Unfortunately, I don't have the, the there is no photograph available of the royal couple which, visiting the Patay Prabhu pavilion. Now, apart from this uh, Rangolis, Patay Prabhus also participated with some of their artifacts in the, in the bigger Bombay uh, exhibition. And you can see the other view of the exhibition where so many other people, uh, apart from Patay Prabhus, have contributed their artifacts. And that is how the exhibition looks. This is again a picture postcard, specially uh, with a design on this. Now, with the success of that particular exhibition, uh, Pataya Prabhu decided that it was high time that after 1909 nothing was done. So they decided, and Imdi Durandar, who uh, was the person who initiated this particular idea of a second exhibition, he said that let us have one more exhibition. And everybody said, okay, let's do it. And then that's how this particular exhibition was conceptualized. You see the exhibition poster, which was also designed by Durandar for that 1926 exhibition. And we let us see the next slide where Durandar ultimately persuaded to that this exhibition should be held. You can see Governor Leslie Wilson is inaugurating the exhibition. The person on the dais is Ms. Right Honorable Amar Jaikar, about which we are going to talk. And there are a whole lot of people. This exhibition was held at Amroli House. Now, this Amroli House is somewhere between uh, uh, near CP Tank, and now thereafter it became a post office, and now even that building is gone. But that was a place where this particular thing was done. It was a residence of uh, uh, Dr. John Wilson, the person who started Wilson High School and Wilson College. And this particular exhibition was held in that premises. Now, let us see about little details about that exhibition. Uh, the hall was full at the time of inauguration by Hindu, Parsi, Christian, Muslim community invitees. And there were 4,800, about uh, of the population of 4,800, 300 graduates, 700 lawyers, 26 artists, but you will see that there is not a single businessman mentioned here. So ultimately 3000 exhibits were exhibited and 300 volunteers were on the job for the exhibition. The exhibition ultimately, uh, it was visited by Sayajira Gaikawad of Baroda on 15th of January, as also Shapuji Sakulatwala, a very prominent businessman from the Tata, from the uh, Tata director's uh, office. The exhibition has opened in 15 January and was visited by 30,000 people of different hearts and community, uh, castes and communities. Now this is a, one of the, there are again one of the views coming from the Pathai Prabhu magazine. The, it, the, the quality is not as good as it should have been like a photograph, but you can have a little look that this is the exhibition, how it is arranged, a little better way of arranging than the 1909 exhibition. And now come to the important part. Now this is a lady who is in the exhibition. She is putting up, she is actually just before the start of the exhibition, she is doing a rangoli with some Krishna, I think, and some gopis and all that. It is on the surface. That means it is on a little block of wood, which is done. Next one is another lady who is doing a rangoli on water. So you have to be very careful because once you put it, anything, you can't rub it. So you have to be so accurate that it stays there. And the next one is something the lady is preparing herself for doing a rangoli underwater. So it used to be put in a, in a sort of a, a metal vessel and of square size. And they used to use uh, uh, some sticky thing, which was yeah, liquid paraffin, in which the rangoli used to be dipped. And thereafter, the rangoli was done. And very slowly, they used to put water so that the rangoli, rangoli is not disturbed. Uh, I understand that this particular art now is uh, become quite famous. Because now we have got the technology as well as other different chemicals which can see that the rangoli is not disturbed. Now again, for this exhibition also, there were two types of certificates. One was issued to the person who was uh, participating in it and the other was issued to the uh, volunteer as, uh, as a compliment. So these are the two certificates of 1926. Now, <clears throat> this particular exhibition, etc. became so famous that Sir Glaston Solomon, principal of the Sir J.J. School of Art, uh, wanted to see the art of Rangoli. 
and Durandar at that time was the superintendent of JJ School of Art. So he requested that let us go and have a look. So Durandar suggested we can do that, but we'll have to wait till we uh, uh, till the Diwali because that is the time when the Rangol is usually done. So they go to the Pathai Prabhu areas which were Thakudwar, Panaswadi, Girgam, then Dadi said Agyari Lane, Naviwadi, and they go in front of one of the houses and you will see that the person who is on the left is uh, Mr. Duranda, the person in the middle is Gladstone Solomon, and the person on the right must be some probably employee of JJ School of Art. So this is how they are watching this in Thakudwar area. Now again, after a little while, the Pathai Prabhu always think of a next exhibition. But this time the exhibition was only, it was decided to be done by the ladies. So there was no participation of the gents. It was not an exhibition as big as the first two ones. So it was an exhibition which was held at the residence of, at the bungalow of Jagannath Shankar Shet at Thakudwa. Now that bungalow was demolished sometime in uh, late 50s. Thereafter the Shankar Shet Smuti building has come there. But Jagannath Shankar Shet being a resident of Thakudwa, he had very good cordial relations with the Patare Prabhus. And very readily he agreed to give his entire house for an exhibition. And uh, Kamla Bai Vasudev, the wife of Justice K.B. Vasudev, whose little biography you are going to see a little later, was the person who, was, uh, who inaugurated the exhibition. And uh, the prize distribution at the end of the exhibition was done at the hand of Annapurna Bai Deshmukh. The most important part is that Netaji Subhash Chandra Bose visited the exhibition. The exhibition had 1,000 exhibits and was open for 15 days. Now these are some of the uh, uh, some of the photographs which appeared in the local newspaper. This is Nawakar on 12th of March 1938. Again a very poor picture. Now this is another photo of 1938, a little better one, where the, the supervisor, the lady volunteers are sitting there. Then the next one again, another, another photograph of the same exhibition and the certificate which was issued. And here is a certificate given for for the culinary art, where under the category of cookery for making biscuits. So this is one of the certificate which has survived, which I could lay my hand on. Now, <clears throat> now let us talk about the other cultural aspect. Now Rangoli being the central, the central artistic endeavor of the Pathare Prabhus. Now Rangolis were done precisely around Diwali time, eight days prior to the starting of the Diwali, which is called by the Pathare Prabhus as Atvinda. And for every diff for all the eight days and thereafter in Diwali, on every day there is a different kind of a rangoli. I will not go into the the central uh, central column because that is on Mar is Marathi, but its equivalent English equivalent is given. So on the Ashtami day, it is the rangoli is of a seat. The Navmi is a door. Dashmi is fruits. Eleventh day, Ekadashi is pillars. Ekadashi in the evening there is something else. Then Vasu Bharat, which is Dwadashi, there is an anchor. Then Dhanat Vayodashi, which is a pond. Again, then Narak Chaturthi, Chaturdashi, that is uh, morning is different, well and a cave. And Amavasya, which is draft and, and lamp, morning and evening. And the new year, which is Bali Pratipada, there is a swastik, which is a Hindu religious symbol. And again, lamp. And on Bhaubi's day also, there is a lamp. So one of the lady, who had done some, some artwork on these particular things. I'm going to show you. That lady was very kind enough to give me that entire little artwork that she has done. I visited her house and she said that I'll send it to you. She posted that particular booklet and before the post could deliver it to me, that lady unfortunately had died. But I received that booklet and I'm just showing, sharing with you what are the different Rangoli's designs that she has conceptualized. And we said that there is a first day, there is a seat on the uh, Ashtami, then there is a door, then there are fruits, there are pillars, then there are Deodaya, that is five temples, then anchor, pond, well, cave, draft, the lamp, swastik, etc. So these were the these were the designs. The designs are of two types. Uh, if you are an artist, then suppose if you have a design of draft, then you actually draw the draft, which is there on the right hand side. But if you are not an artist, then there is an equivalent uh, which is available in the in the Pataya Prabhu uh, design design part is that you draw a rangoli with dots and you connect the dots and there is a design the central one you will see is a design which is uh, which is of arti swastik is shown in that so this is a design similarly you will see the left one there is a 
if you are an artist you will do the lower one which has got an aarti and coconut and everything in the thali but if you are not an artist then you do it with dots which is just above it and that looks like uh, it is supposed to be the aarti so now let us come to the culinary art now culinary art is something which the patare prabhus are very proud of unfortunately there is no authentic uh, patare prabhu uh, there is no there is no restaurant giving you authentic patare prabhu food so probably next time you want to eat you will have to probably come to my house or go to your friend's house where it is available now when the patare prabhus arrived in bombay what was the what was the what was available there there were coconut trees there were fish because it was nearest to the sea and there was rice so quite a few of the patare prabhu dishes swirl around this particular three things apart from that patare prabhu like parsis are strict non vegetarians except on the days on which they have their they have their festivals etc they observe uh, they they have a vegetarian food and particularly during festivals they have a particular design menu which they follow or they are supposed to follow now there is a lady called lakshmi bai durandar who has written a book in 1910 and published it saying hazar pakak ya means 1000 recipes now make no mistake that these 1000 recipes are not yeah 1000 recipes are not of the patari prabhus they are recipes all european recipes italian dishes etc vegetarian non vegetarian there are all sorts of things so let us see what this kind of book is this it was published as a gruhini mitra or a friend of the lady the this particular book used to be given handed over to a girl who was getting married by her mother so that when she goes to her in laws place she has got a ready book with all the recipes so she can feed the entire joint family of his of her husband and make them happy so that's how the book was being given between 1910 and 1940 with an edition of 2000 each it ran into eight editions now as a collector i have got uh, the third sixth and the eighth edition but i am still looking for the balance the book contains all the recipes not only that as i said special recipes for banquet religious festivals fast even patient recuperating from illnesses all those food are also given the recipes are european desserts soups side dishes snacks vegetarian non vegetarian everything now let us come to some of the leading personalities of patare prabhus lieutenant colonel kanuba ranchodas kritika born in 1849 studied in wilson high school grand medical college did his uh, uh, mbbs then ultimately gave a few exams in uk and he was posted as a staff general surgeon in karachi uh, he fought the afghan war at kandahar Uh, not fought but as, as a medical officer posted as a civil surgeon in thane fellow of the bombay university examiner for at anatomy etc health officer appointed special health officer for plague which was there from 1896 till almost till 1915 16 retired as a brigadier general died in 1913 apart from that he was a sanskrit and a marathi scholar wrote sonnets poetry president of the sahitya sammelan at baroda all india medical sammelan mathura he was a botanical secretary of bnhs and was a justice of peace made by the government of bombay now let us come to another person nanu narayan kothare born in 1847 studied in wilson high school wilson college llb from government law college joined, joined the solicitors firm a solicitor held as an article clerk passed his solicitors exam and also started his practice as nanu solicitor in 1876 took a parsi partner ormaji chisgar and the firm became nanu and ormaji and for your kind information the firm is still existing but the name has changed a little bit nano hamaji and company it is the fifth generation of solicitors who are continuing that firm even today now very important thing about him as i mentioned about chandaram ji high school which was one of the venues in 1909 for the 1909 exhibition his client and friend chandaram ji said he had made a will chandaram ji said was little sad because although he was such a, a rich person his wife was uneducated so he wanted to establish a school in bombay for the poor people so that they the poor girls so that they can take education from that school but that did not happen during his lifetime now nanurayan kothare had drafted his will and he was one of the executors of the will as per the directions in the will he distributed all the property to whoever the legatees were and subsequently there was a Amount of around three lakhs 
which remained balanced. Now there was no provision in the bill as to what is to be done with that three lakhs. So he applied to the Bombay High Court and said that this particular amount which is lying unutilized, it was the wish of the settler that uh, that this was the wish of the testator that this that he wanted to create a school. So he said, if you permit me, I will set up a school. And that is how and Bombay High Court gave him an order under a doctrine of Cipre. That's a particular doctrine under the Bombay uh, 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 under the Succession Act. And he set up the school, which is Chandaramji High School. And he was the first president. And that is how the school also gave the premises for that exhibition. So this is how he uh, continued the school. And uh, the school is still functioning. It was, it was originally a girls school. And now it has become a, a co-ed school. This is near CP tank. And uh, quite a few Pathari Prabhu girls and middle class, uh, girls from middle class families studied there. Uh, Mr. Danuna and Kothari died on 13th of December, uh, 29th of December 1913. His son, Raghunandan, he, he continued the firm. Thereafter, his son, Dilip, he continued the firm. And the fourth generation, Raghuvir, who unfortunately died a couple of years ago at the very ripe age of 94, he continues. And now his son, Nimish, is running that particular firm. He, Nanuna and Kothari was a member of quite a few Pathai Prabhu institutions. And uh, he, he also he thought that he should also spend quite a bit of his time and money in ensuring that there is literacy among the, the female, uh, the females or the daughters of the Bombay residents. Next one, I have, there are quite a few people, but I have just selected some of them who are lawyers and who became judges of the High Court. So Justice Vasudev Jagannath Kirtikar, again, he born in 39. Matriculation from uh, Elphiston High School, graduated at Elphiston College, be, passed an LLB exam, obtained a Sanad, and he was uh, given Rao Sahib title by the government. He taught in Ahmedabad Law School, Law College, attend, and he attended the Maharaja Radhanpur in Privy Council. Now, Privy Council was the apex court during the British time. There was no Supreme Court. Appeals from high courts all over India would go to Privy Council. Then he started practice in Bombay High Court in 1872. He also defended Maharaja Baroda in a civil case. He also defended Maharaja Baroda in a murder trial against him also successfully. He was appointed government pleader. That means the, the lawyer to represent the government. He rejected the offer of prime ministership of Baroda state. Although he was given a princely sum of 5,000 rupees. He was offered in 1897, which was a big sum. Even the judges of the Bombay High Court did not get that kind of a salary. 1902, he was elevated to the bench of the Bombay High Court as an acting judge. Because uh, Justice Chandavarkar was uh, uh, appointed on a commission, uh, on a commission which was appointed by Bombay uh, government. He resigned thereafter. He came back to the practice, then resigned as a government pleader in 1906. This year is very important when I come to his grandson. I will tell you why this is important. Then, government of Bombay conferred him with a title of Justice of Peace, died in Bombay in 1909. Did a lot of philanthropic work and also social work. He wrote a lot of periodicals on Vedanta philosophy. Now we come to Amar Jaikar, that is the grandson of uh, Vasudev Kirtikar. The man, his Amar Jaikar's mother's father was Kirtikar. Born in 1873, matriculation from Elphiston College, graduated from St. Xavier's College, post graduation in Elphiston College, law degree from Oxford. Then he uh, joined the Gray's Inn and was called to the bar in 1905. After becoming a, a barrister, he came back to Bombay, started practice in 1905. He entered politics. And he was responsible, he and Tej Badu Safru were responsible for persuading Mahatma Gandhi to attend a second round conference in London, which they did. And he traveled with him uh, 1916 to 1937, involved in political, social, religious, and cultural activities. In 1937, he was called to the bench of federal court. Now, federal court was something which was established by the government in 1935 under the Government of India Act of 1935, whereby uh, any interpretation of, uh, the, it was like a constitution at that time. Any interpretation of federal uh, federal court term for the federal the, the constitution would be entertained by federal court. It was not an appeal court. Their appeal still would go from high court directly to the privy council. He was judge of the federal court. He was one of the first three judges who were appointed in 1937. Chief Justice Morris Squire, who came from London, Shah Justice Shah Suleiman, Chief Justice of Allahabad High Court, was also put into the federal court, and Mr. Jacob was directly taken from the practice. There's a very interesting uh, incident which took place while I was going through the files while curating the Supreme Court exhibition. 
that I found in the National Archive, there's a file where the, the question was as to what sort of a dress the judges of the federal court would wear. Because there was no such concept of a federal court between High Court and the Privy Council anywhere in the British colony. So ultimately, the three judges decided that Mr. Jaikar will decide what sort of a dress they should wear. Now, Mr. Jaikar was not a fashion designer or anything. He contacted Asquith and Lord, which are the big department store, which is there. The, the building is there, but department store is not there. Where you have a bank of Travancore and you have the Ripon Club on the top. Now, in that building was Asquith and Lord, who were the uh, who were uh, who could uh, do the fashion designing, etc. But see, this since this was this has something to do with the legal profession. Asquith and Lord contacted Eden Ravencroft in London, who did the wigs, who, who did the uh, the gowns and other uh, legal paraphernalia, and and Eden Ravencroft sent certain designs which were accepted by ultimately accepted by M.R. Jaikar and shown to the other two judges who accepted. And for the first time, we had in judiciary, and M.R. Jaikar is wearing that uh, particular dress. Unfortunately, this is a black and white picture where the judicial paraphernalia was in navy blue. Normally, we associate with scarlet or black, but this was navy blue. So that is how M.R. Jaikar managed to have a dress designed for the federal court. Ultimately, in 1939, he was elevated to the judicial committee of his Majesty's Privy Council, that is the highest court. He was one of the seven judges who presided over the Privy Council from 1909 to 1946. And <clears throat> ultimately, uh, in 1941, he resigned because he wanted to come back to politics. He was appointed as a member of the Constituent Assembly in 1946, but he vacated his place for uh, Dr. B. R. Ambedkar. And ultimately, Dr. B. R. Ambedkar was the uh, author, uh, he, was the, uh, he was the chairman of the drafting committee of the constitution. He was M.R. Jaikar after retiring everywhere. He was vice chancellor of Pune University. He, in fact, he donated his property to Pune University. That building is still there. It is now a film institute. And he died in Bombay in 1959. Now let us come to another judge, <coughs> Ganpat Sadachiv Rao, born in 1950. He educated himself in a Patari Prabhu institution, which was Prabhu Seminary School, then in, in, in Ilfinston School, uh, uh, institute from which he passed his matriculture exam, BA in mathematics from Elphiston College. He could not unfortunately pass in mathematics. So he then decided that he'll do BA in history and economics. Then after that, he did MA in English and Latin. In those days, I suppose you could switch all these different uh, subjects. Then he acted as a fellow in Elphiston College, then went back to Pra Prabhu Seminary as a, as a headmaster. Can you imagine after doing all this MA and everything goes back to the school? Then acted as a senior teacher in Robert Money Institute, which was located at Dobitala, where now you have Jar Mahal. Then he passed his LLB exam uh, in 1980, started practice in the small causes court. Then he started practice in the high court. And his maternal uncle Pandurang Balibhadra, he was with him. And then there are, he in the process of his career as an, as, an, as an advocate between 1885 and 1892, he represented Maharaja Mahara of Kutch, appeared in the famous case, Baba Maharaj case of Pune, appeared in the Bom for the Bombay government before the Aund Commission. He was appointed as a Justice of Peace, Professor of Government Law College, Principal of Government Law College, appointed as a government pleader in 1908, and finally appointed as a High Court judge. And he died in 1920. I forgot to mention, I had mentioned about that 1906 particular date. And I said that I'll come back to it because that was a time when M.R. Jaikar passed his exam and came to Bombay to uh, practice, so his, so his grandfather, maternal grandfather, Justice Kirtikar, he felt that, Jai, he, he, that Mr. M.R. Jaikar should not take the benefit of his grandfather's practice and he should establish his own clan. So he retired so that his grandson can independently practice. Very noble thought. Now we have another judge of the Bombay High Court, was Kweshav Barkrishna Vasudev. Remember, his, he was the wife of the person who inaugurated the second exhibition in, of the art and craft in 1926. Born in 1880, 1883, passed matriculation exam from John Connon High School, a BA from St. Davis College, LLB uh, first class from and received a Justice Spencer's Prize. Passed the advocate's exam in 1907, joined provincial ser civil service, appointed as a sessions judge, elevated as an acting session judge, confirmed as permanent district judge, confirmed as the first, first grade judge and finally elevated to Bombay High Court, and he retired and died in 1956. Now let us come to M.V. Durandar. We have some, some of his artwork, 
Ibn Durandar was a prominent artist, not exactly from the, at the uh, when the period doesn't quite uh, coincide with Raja Ravi Varma, but there's a little overlapping period. And Durandar was actually very friendly with Raja Ravi Varma. In fact, Ravi Varma Press also printed quite a few of Durandar's paintings as prints and were sold at, as calendars, etc. Born in 1867, his childhood in Kolhapur, studied at JJ School of Art, won Waddington Prize. He learned, learned he, he got a lot of prizes uh, from uh, Bombay Art Society exhibitions. He was an art teacher in 1896 in JJ School of Art. He got this, he got he kept on having gold medals. The second gold medal in 1904, third one in 1907, and 1910 he became the headmaster of JJ School of Art. The fourth gold medal in 1910, fifth one in 1914. It was like a monopoly. Inspector of Drawing and Craft in Sir JJ School of Art got the Wimbledon uh, Wembley Exhibition Prize. He was given the title of Rao Bahadur by the Bombay government in 1929. Most important thing is that he did four murals of which we are going to have a look for the Imperial Secretary. It was a commissioned artwork of a huge size, and we are going to see them for the for the for the uh, for the central government, that is the government in Delhi, appointed to officiate as a director of Sir JJ School of Art. He did 16 compositions of mural art for Chota Udaipur, two painting, painting of Diamond Jubilee celebration and Maharaj of Baroda, toured Europe extensively, did a lot of uh, artworks, died in 1944. Most important part is that he did in his lifetime almost 50,000 artworks in oil on canvas, watercolor, charcoal, pencil, pen, graphic, uh, graphite, and ink. Now let us have a look at some of his artistic work. This was the work where he got the gold medal from Bombay Art Society. This is a typical uh, drawing. This is a difficult uh, artwork of a gauri. As I told you, the balsam part, a girl is bringing the gauri in the house. And this is the picture where she is welcome. There are, there are children. And this is the one which uh, got the prize. Now let us see the, and uh, for that particular thing, he got in 1892 the Art Society Prize, Jamsheji Tata Prize, and this is the copy of the certificate, signed by the President Bird Wood. Then the next one, Governor's Prize, is in 1922 for his artwork, <coughs> uh, which was a government, it was a Governor's Prize, and there are a whole lot of uh, certificates which I'm not going to show all of them. Now, <coughs> there are certain pictures which were such as artworks which were particularly uh, watercolors which were converted into picture postcards. So this is a, on the left hand side you will see that there is a girl, there is a lady who is sitting and reading and there are so, so many other girls, probably her friends or family members who are listening to her because she is a lady who is who is, seems to be literate, she is reading probably a newspaper or some sort of a document and the other ladies while they are doing their work, they are still listening to her one is doing stitching, other is doing some something with the grain, rice grain. And on the right hand side is a typical Patare Prabhu who would have been in 1900, how he would have looked in 1900. He is going out. Look at his dress. He's got a typical pagdi, a very drooping moustache. Then he has got a black dagla. Then he's wearing a white thing, which is an inner garment, which is called the barabandi. There's a little pocket in front where he would keep his uh, handkerchief and a little uh, dabi of tapkir and there's a there's a red bordered dhoti, dhoti and there is a footwear which is called sapat and a walking stick so this is how a patare prabhu gentleman middle aged would look in those days uh, as per durandar's drawing now there are some other drawings also by durandar he is showing the patare prabhu fashion now in the uh, the left hand the lady on the top left hand side drawing is of around 1870s where the lady is completely wrapped up in the shawl. Then in 1880s, she has become a little bold. She has opened up the shawl and she, she is showing a little bit of her sari, although the head is covered. 1890, she has become still bold. And now I think a little influence of the British also is there because she's carrying an umbrella like a walking stick. Her shawl is wrapped up in a very different manner. She's got a very beautiful blouse. She's wearing some flowers which are not otherwise seen in the earlier pictures. She's got a uh, she's got a blouse which has got a little collar, and she's ready to go. Now the the one which is below also is a, a typical Durandas uh, artwork of Patare Prabhu girls. In the afternoon they are having a chat, and different types of uh, blouses, different type of saris. 
the way the way they are worn and the ladies are talking chatting and all their different styles fashionable styles dunder also did a lot of work on the head design according to him the a person or the community to which he belonged could be easily found out from the kind of headgear that he is wearing now you'll see a patare prabhu headgear third line from the top on the right is a patare prabhu and that is his headgear around the time of this design which was been around 1900 now let us see those uh, artwork commissioned artwork which were there in the imperial uh, uh, galleries in the uh, imperial secretariat now this is a typical court scene of a sabad sadar diwani adalat which was there in bombay for appeals from different uh, lower judiciary in the bombay presidency and here is the judge is consulting a pandit because probably the uh, some question of hindu law is involved so he is taking his opinion and pandit is trying to explain the pandit is not the judge the one who is sitting with the wig is actually the judge but he is listening to him to understand the different concepts of dharma shastra next one now this is a part of that particular design let us see the full design so it is a 15 feet by 5 feet full mural in color and there is a whole lot of not only the court scene but as a consequence of what is happening things are also happening on the left hand side and right hand side you can see some ladies are in desperation they are trying to cry there on the left hand side there is somebody who is trying to uh, tell everyone what is happening so this is one design the second one is a a dowry which was prevalent that time and this is the design where the 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 father of the the bride is handing over a whole lot of ornaments and jewelry as a dowry to the son in law and son in law is very gladly accepting it now this is the second one the third one is a uh, something to do with the mohammedan law according to the mohammedan law at that time a person on the death bed the person to whom he hands over the keys would become the owner so here there are two hands which are coming forward and the others are mourning probably didn't realize the con but there are two hands which are straight away coming forward to collect the keys so that was the that was the third design the fourth one is the concept of adoption now adoption is something which is there only in hindu law and it is not there in any other law so adoption is something where you can see the priest is the doing that ceremony of adoption and there would be adoptive parents and the parents who are giving in adoption they'll be there in a fuller picture and just showing a portion of that picture and there is some priest who is saying some mantras as a part of the adoption ceremony now durandar also did lot of artwork for for magazines for books etc and one of them is here even if for the advertisement of a very prominent photographer of patare prabhu mn kirtikar even his particular uh, advertisement is done now this particular portion would appear on the back side of the of the photograph which is put on a uh, on a thick uh, on a thick paper and this would appear at the back side of that particular photograph now let us come to some of the things which are uh, when not properly understood certain mistakes that could be made you can see the stamp on the right hand side which i think a couple of years ago or a year ago this stamp was released as part of the indian fashion and below it is written patare prabhu now the funniest part is that the lady who is shown in the forefront is actually not a patare prabhu she is a lady of different community and she has been roped in as patare prabhu and in fact the lady who is behind the one which is now magnified in the picture on the left hand side is a lady which is patare prabhu adopted from durandar's painting uh, which he, uh, he illustrated a book of rothfeld Uh, called women of india in 1920 and this is the picture of that lady you see uh, that lady uh, it is uh, it is said that probably this lady is going to the club or something she is wearing shoes and she is now getting ready with a kind of a dress which she is and the sh and the shawl which she is going to eventually wear is lying on the table aside she has got that typical blouse and she is probably looking into the mirror to see whether everything is proper now let us see what are the uh, patare prabhus uh, who are <coughs> of who are first in public life either in in bombay or in india or in community itself now ramchandra balakrishna jaikar was a graduate of elphiston 
institute of 1827 he was one of the first batches bhau lakshman harish chandra ji he built a ferry wharf dock known as bhau sadakka in 1841 and gave it to the government for government to uh, use it as a dock rao badul nana moru ji first indian judicial magistrate of 1857 mr janardhan vasudev ji first indian judge of bombay high court in 1864 mind you the high court came in 1862 and he was appointed as a judge immediately after 2 years khandera moru ji first indian solicitor about the notice native solicitor of 1858 now what had happened was that actually he would not have been the first one there was another pathare prabhu who was vinayak harishchandra ji who for becoming a solicitor you had to actually sign articles and they were, at that time the solicitor all the solicitors with whom articles would be signed were all british when a application was made by vinayak harishchandra ji and he even offered to pay 4000 rupees for being taken as article clerk none of the british uh, solicitors were ready to do it eventually he is he uh, uh, offer came from a solicitor in calcutta he said you come there i am to willing to take you as an uh, article clerk because of that the solicitors in bombay came into disrepute and uh, and uh, rules were changed and ultimately signed articles in bombay but by the time he was enrolled nana nana uh, this uh, jagan uh, kandera moru ji was already enrolled as first thereafter uh, even other other one uh, mr kamruddin tayyar ji was second and then ultimately uh, uh, ultimately vinayak harishan was the third anyway narayan dinanath welkar first indian municipal commissioner of bombay in 1870 sokar bapu ji trilokekar writer of the drama first musical drama in maharashtra so he was much before kirloskar who is otherwise given the credit of a, a musical drama sonabai jaykar a hindu girl to pass final exam from alexandra girls high school in 1890 dr sadashiv jaykar who was called the muskati jaykar was a zoologist who discovered quite a few species of fishes in muskat and those species are named after him then govin bhau prabhakar hindu eye surgeon qualified in england in 1891 ishwashand jaykar hindu surgeon qualified in england in 1892 shukar bapu ji tarpade flew unmanned aeroplane in bombay in 1895 many years before the right brothers who of course did the manned uh, aeroplane this particular aeroplane had uh, mercury as a fuel and it was done on vedic principles because we have heard about pushpak viman etc in our mythologies so he did that and an experiment was carried out at the birgam chopati and which was attended supposed to have been attended by sayaji rao gaikwad and justice ranade then rao badur kirtikar was indian producer first indian producer of film pundalik unfortunately could not get distributor so he could not distribute the film and ultimately the the although he did it in 1912 then ultimately that particular honor went to somebody else rao badur mv durandar we talked about indian director of the jj school of art and mr jaykar who was the first hindu judge of federal court out of the seven judges who was the first hindu judge of the federal court and first judge of, Mar- of from maharashtra on judicial committee of privy council now let us come to another lady mohantara ajinkya now i don't know how many people know but if you are in film music and particularly during the black and white era in the 40s she was mohantara tarpade born in november 1928 in a musical atmosphere her father sundara tarpade was a able actor poet harmonium player she started singing on all india radio bombay from the time she was around 7 years she took initial training from hirabai javeri shamal bai mazgaonkar at swami samarth vidyalay since and since nine and since 1940 giving up giving up her school etc she solely concentrated on classical music under jagannath bua purohit and subsequently under mehul hussain of muradabad she was equally comfortable singing light classicals as well as playback singing in hindi films till i started researching on her she incidentally happens to be the uh, maternal aunt of my wife i started sir, researching on her i found that she started her career in the hindi films in 1942 from the fi- after the film mama ji was released and at that time there were established female singers like raj kumari jora bai lalit lalita paralkar shamshad begum amir bai at the same time at that time most of the famous heroines used to sing their own song such as shanta bai hubli kar ratan bai vanmala sitara devi shobhna samad nasim banu 
Shanta Apte, Noor Jahan, Surayya, and even Nalini Jaiman. So it was very tough for any person to actually start doing uh, professional singing in Hindi films. But that opportunity, she got it. Between 1942 and 1955, uh, she sang around 144 Hindi songs, including solo and duets with Muhammad Rafi, Mukesh, Gita Roy, who became Gita Dutt Lab subsequently, Sham Sundar, Amir Bai, Manik Verma, C. Ramchandra, Meena Kapoor, Zora Bai, Lata Mangeshkar, Lalita Deurkar, Shamshad Begum, and Asha Bosle, Surayya, and Rajkumari. In the film Patanga, there is a very, very peculiar song in 1949, which is sung by four, four people. She sang with Shamshad, C. Ramchandra, and Rafi. After her marriage on 13 February 1949, she continued to play, uh, do this playback singing. But the new era of non-classical songs had started taking over. We had music directors who started giving different kind of music, although it was melodious, but that was not Mohantara's, was not accustomed to it. However, she continued singing on AIR and cut quite a few Marathi Bhagwat, Bhagwat Bhaugit records for HMV. She used to participate in classical musical competition known as conferences in late 40s and has won many prizes. And you'll be surprised to know that in one of the conferences, she even defeated Lata Mangeshkar in that conference. She was a very shy person, but as an artist, she was full of confidence while singing in innumerable Mayfields. She died at the age of 74 on 31 January 2002. Now we have talked about the history of all the Pathai Prabhus who are no more. Now let us talk about a Pathai Prabhu who is very much living and who has, since she has married outside the community, probably the community did not know, but thanks to my uh, friend Devani Jaikar, she said that there is a lady who is not only a prolific Kathak dancer, but is also a Padma Bhushan. And then I was surprised. I talked to her and found out her bio. Very interesting. Born on 17 May 1930 at Bhaiji Vanji Lane, Takudwa. She was one of the foremost dancers of Kathak. She is today. She is a distinguished disciple of traditional Kathak gurus like Shambhu Maharaj, Birju Maharaj, both Lucknow Gharana, Sundar Prasad, Radhalal Mishra of Jaipur Gharana and Ashik Hussain of Baranas Gharana. In her capacity as a dancer, teacher and choreographer, she had held many prestigious positions. She was vice president of the International Dance Council. Her choreographic work is also considered, considered classic and many of the of the innovations she premiered, they have become ingrained in basket packed for him. She has received many awards and honors such as Padma Shri, Kalidas Sammelan, Nagar Bhushan, Omna Thakur Award, Ahmedabad City Award, the Gujarat State Sangin Natak Academy Award for Dance in 1978, the, the Sangit Natak Academy Award of 1982, and the Padma Vibhushan in 2010. She's elected Tagore Fellow of the Sangit Natak Academy for her contribution to Indian dance. She resides in Andaval and runs the school Kadamba, and she's extremely active at a very young age of 90 years. Now, let us see that after having analyzed the Patare Prabhus, let us see how they stand vis a vis other communities. Let us see the chart. The arrival, Pathai Prabhus arrived in around 1896. There is a little mistake. Uh, other communities like Muslims, they arrived in 14th century. Christians arrived in 16th century. Parsis in 17th and others in 18th, 19th and 20th century. How did they arrive? The, they arrived as a whole community came there along with Raja Bimba. As far as other communities were concerned, they slowly came in groups over a period of time. Purpose of arrival, they were displaced early by from the earlier abode. As far as other communities were concerned, invasion, conversion, better prospects. The main avocation of the Patai Prabhus were lawyers, judges, doctors, artists, clerks, and dramatists. In fact, the word Prabhu was synonymous with the word clerk because they acted as a bridge between their earlier rulers, like the Portuguese and also the British. So that was the that was their avocations. As far as other communities were concerned, business, profession, and other available options. Cultural base, a firm base due to complete literacy and early arrival. Now, talking of literacy, the ladies during even Portuguese period could, could speak and write Portuguese, and the and the literacy is hundred percent. Had to and as far as the other community, they had to create base after more community persons migrated over a period of time. Present population around 10,000 all over the world. And the, the other population, of course, of the other communities in lakhs, maybe the Parsis, I, I say 70,000 could be less. Literacy 100%, in other communities, it is of varying degrees. Now, we come to the last chapter, which is a little controversial chapter, but I will not 
run away from it if there are controversies let there be like of the widow remarriage although patai prabhus were learned etc but in their observances they were little orthodox they would not they would not like a widow remarriage in their community that such a remarriage took place in around 1860s where a person who was canvassing that widow should be remarried but uh, and he himself lost his wife so he decided i am going to marry a widow now that particular thing was not appreciated but he, he still went ahead and married a young widow ultimately it became so desperate for those people because of the the kind of treatment that they got from their own community that eventually they committed suicide by jumping into a well somewhere somewhere near uh, august kranti maidan at the, that is the place where they they were residing so that was the end of their widow me marriage subsequently of course there was a commotion in the community and with the passage of time now widow remarriage did start happening but that was the beginning which was made is start even started a, a sort of a association for uh, encouraging widow widow remarriage now there is a there is a very serious matter of a sati now sati is something which was a concept which is not there in the patai prabhus but in around 1830 uh, 1820s there was a sati at surat a lady dwarka bai when her husband died she decided that she is going to go sati now that was a very shock to the to the children because the she was herself a quite a senior lady and she had grown up children so they tried to persuade her that she doesn't have to do it she said no it is my ultimate happiness now in those days the britishers the sati abolition act had not come in so the britishers had a policy of not interfering in the religious beliefs of the community and therefore they, they but there were there were restrictions so the restriction was that the collector of the place had to go and ascertain whether the lady was doing it voluntarily or she was being forced to do it so one mr anderson assistant collector who goes to her house to find out and uh, persuade her said please don't do it it's a very uh, it's something which will hurt you you will not you are not going to enjoy this so please don't do it she said no i am going to do it he tried to check up with the family members etc and found out that she was doing it voluntarily in fact the family members were crying and trying to persuade her not to do it but she decides to do it ultimately in surat it appears 15 years before there was no other sati so it became a very uh, a sort of an event and uh, thousands of people in surat came to the, the to the uh, to the banks of the tapi river where there was a where there was a, a sort of a crematorium and this then then she was taken there she was sitting on the with the husband's head in her lap and that is how she was carried to the cremation ground and ultimately uh, she sat and she sat on the wooden pyre she arranged she arranged uh, uh, the wood the wooden things on this then she poured even uh, ghee on it and ultimately just before it was going to be lighted anderson again went there and told her that look even at this point of time you can retreat and i will ensure that you will be taken back etc she said no i am quite firm i want to do it so there were two there were there were two coconuts one, the, on the pyre out of which she picked up one of them and threw it in a particular direction saying that the next sati will be in that direction now we don't know whether that sati came from that direction but after that the pyre was lit and ultimately within about 10 minutes everything was over anderson had to make a report to the governor in council governor and governor general in council about the about the entire event and 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 dr vidi rao in his thesis had annexed a copy of that report which gives the entire vivid description of this sati episode and after having done that the important thing is that that particular coconut it appears was picked up by one of the members of that community and from time to time it has passed on and it has now come to a family who is my actually the 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 first cousin and i have actually seen that particular coconut in their house which is inserted in a in a sort of a, a mask uh, uh, you know you know not a mask but a, a mukhauta what you call as and it is inserted in that and it is being done puja on the day on which she went sati so that is sati now kansore prabhu is another very uh, sad event in around 1780 there was a wedding and in those days there was no invitation etc when there is a wedding i think every entire community used to come there and in the wedding there was a uh, there was a tradition that uh, as far as the males were concerned the ganda will be put on their forehead according to their standing in the society 
but there was one young fellow who decided that i am going to do it straight away linear in a linear manner i am not going to do according to this so that it is quick and fast so he started doing it so the people who were of some standing they felt insulted and they tried to stop him from doing it he still continued to do it and there was a big commotion some other some other of his relatives supported him and then those people who were present there they thought that they were like a general body of the society of the of the community and they outcast him the the, the the that particular person and his other people so out of disgust he threw that that pot from which he was putting that tilak on the ground which was called in prabhu terms consola so that pot was cast control now what has happened was those people were excommunicated from this initially that effect was not felt in 1836 first attempt was made by that consola section of the community to reunite because it was quite fresh not even 50 years had gone by to reunite but that effort was thwarted that uh, community did not give any credence to that because there was no written application nothing some oral request was made subsequently another attempt was made in around 1896 at which point of time uh, the matter was referred to janardan vasudev ji the first judge of the bombay high court and he said that yes it appears from whatever documents or whatever statement they have produced they could be the members of the they may they, the breakaway faction could be the members of original patai prabhu community but now having made an effort um, almost after 100 years it is time barred you know I, i don't understand how it can be time barred either they are there or they are not there if they are there it can't be time barred anyway so that attempt failed a very serious attempt was made in 1920s what they made was they made a written application signed by then existing 46 people from the male members from the community and they made an application to the patai prabhu charities which was the main organization which uh, looked after the poor etc and the organization which was then flush with money than other community organizations and that application was made to them now those people they said that all right if you say so please present your documents and they formed a consola commission they made a sort of a sub committee to decide whether their uh, claim was correct or not so they submitted documents etc but before those documents could be considered what happened was that a mem- the a uh, girl from that consola section married a boy from the main community and there was such a there such a big commotion there that at the, the different community at different community forums they were uh, the con- the consola prabhus were talked in a very derogatory manner etc so ultimately that uh, the secretary of the commission mr lb nayak he suggested to them that see in this atmosphere you better withdraw your application because if you still insist on being this matter being decided by the community there is every chance that you will not get justice so believing in that they withdrew the application and uh, so they now after withdrawing the application obviously the patai babu charity said that the sub committee should be dissolved but there is nothing for them to decide so they dissolved that commission but they these people the controllers did not stop there they went to uh, the jagadguru shankaracharya and showed all the documents to him and said that please tell us whether this is uh, that our uh, this particular are we are really a, a breakaway faction of the patai prabhu and whether we have followed we have been following all these years all that the cultural and other uh, traditions of the patai prabhu and please give us a adnya patra so that ultimately adnya patra was given which said that <clears throat> yes you are a breakaway faction of the patai prabhu and therefore uh, you should be admitted now they, the consul did not stop there they went to the nano energy and company solicitors appointed them and sent a brief as a council brief for uh, advice a sort of a written opinion and that opinion was of right honorable mr jaykar mr jaykar also after seeing all those documents ultimately said that yes they should be admitted but by that time since the commission was dissolved they had to make a fresh application after the application was made uh, shankaracharya said that it is better that uh, instead of announcing my adnya patra i would rather give a chance to the charities to come and also have their say so he arranged a meeting in a temple near thakudwar and called the office bearers of patai prabhu charities and also the consola prabhu they all assembled there but before a day before the charities made a trick 
they said they told their secretaries that you are going to attend the meeting and first raise a controversy that the shankaracharya doesn't have a jurisdiction to go into this community matter and when the meeting started these two people got up and said that you have no jurisdiction and we have not appointed you by consent to decide this matter so please don't interfere into the community matter so anchimetri jagadeva shankaracharya said he was the dr kurtakoti of karvir peet so he said that if i wanted to bring a, a sort of a conciliation but if that is not happening then unfortunately not, i can do nothing about it and that's how the matter there in 1946 the last attempt was made by 32 people of the community saying that we have shrunk to such a small section in order to keep our purity we have all the marriage etc took place within our community there are no inter caste marriages and now a situation has come that if we have to continue like this we will have to marry our own cousins so please admit us the community said all this thing is now old we are not going to do anything and ultimately that controversy died thereafter of course kansore prabhu's intermarry they can come they had intermarriages etc and that community is also existing simultaneously so these are some of the controversies which are there before i end i forgot to mention a very important thing that happened sometime in, during the time of peshwas when peshwas in 1730s had taken possession of solset island at, at basin and it was uh, <clears throat> from the portuguese and at that time uh, there was a controversy between the patai prabhu community and their own rajgurus and their and their rajgurus so therefore the uh, and, i'm sorry not their own rajgurus but some other rajgurus who felt that patai prabhu community does not employ them for their marriage and other rituals so they ultimately said and there was a there was a case of that widow widow uh, there was another case where a uh, person wanted to marry a widow and that and the community said no so that person did not marry so taking that they ultimately uh, wrote to the uh, to the suba of uh, solset that that this is a this is how these people are they are of their their origin is not from raja bimbadev they are shudras they are not chatriyas that they are claiming and such declaration should be done so that that particular the subedar of basim he made such a recommendation to uh, balaji balaji bajirao peshwa in pune and without giving an opportunity to the patai babu community that was accepted and they were held to be shudras and Uh, the and the pujaris were told that you go and do perform the pujas not as for the kshatriyas but for the shudras now this particular thing started hurting the community almost it took 40 years for the community to ultimately decide that they are going to ultimately do something else that subedar was gone and they the other subedar had come and he found that the earlier subedar who had done that had done this ex parte he never consulted the community so then he said that he called both the 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 faction of those brahmins etc and the community and ultimately decided that actually they are they are not uh, shudras they are kshatriyas and recommendation was made to the uh, to uh, the peshwa by that time it was madhavara peshwa and uh, madhavara peshwa consulted his chief justice uh, ramkrishna uh, uh, this uh, the prabhu ne ramshastri prabhu ne and ultimately decided he reversed that judgment and declared them as uh, kshatriyas and told the brahmin that you perform puja as kshatriyas Nana Fadnavis, the Prime Minister, was not happy with this, so he called that uh, the emissary who had come to Pune on behalf of Patai Prabhu's one Shastri had come. He called him and the Chief Justice to his residence to find out whether Peshwa's decision is right or wrong. And uh, Rav Shastri Prabhu said that look, the decision is appears to be right. The documents submitted are genuine, and in any case, those documents also have a supporting Adnya Patra of Shankara Charya. You can't deny his authority. At least in those days, authority was accepted. and ultimately they decided that uh, the patai prabhu was a kshatriya and that's how the controversy ended so i think i have dealt with all the controversies the good bad and the ugly and we come to the end of my talk i hope you are enjoyed i am ready to take questions okay so uh, dr jayaka the first question was is this a mumbai centric community or where else in maharashtra can we find patare prabhus see it is not mumbai centric community when they came they were at different parts of uh solset which was which is the island from bandra to uh, uh up to basin that island they were there mm -hmm. they were there at cheul and other places also so the mm -hmm. community although most majority of the community like the parsis was situated in bombay but uh the community did not only remain in bombay the main the main focus of the community was bombay and now of course 
they are spread all over but still i would say the majority of the community still continues to remain in bombay one of the very early questions was you explained that a prabhu is a clerk what does pathare refer to pathare is a is a is a, a sort of a, a word which came from patane prabhu because they appear to have come from patan in gujarat so the patan mm -hmm. since they came from gujarat and they had gujarat mm -hmm. as their also their language in uh, during the time before they came to uh, mumbai patan na prabhu became patane prabhu became pathare prabhu so that's a oh, little okay. abbreviation so uh, the next question is sort of related to what you just explained uh, the question from kaizad was that uh, uh, though they came from rajasthan gujarat etc they sort of seem to have very closely mingled with the maharashtrians so uh, what so so what could be the reasons for that see when they came from gujarat etc i remember up to my grandmother's time is i'm talking of uh, late 1950s when my uh -huh. grandmother used to talk it was it was a pathare prabhu dialect of marathi language where there were plenty of gujarati words which were used even today sometimes somehow suddenly a gujarati word i, I also say uh, so therefore uh, having it appears that they stayed in gujarat for a long time for that for that language to be engrafted into this but after they came to bombay they adopted the local language and slowly the gujarat the gujarat effect started wearing off and now we are perfectly maharashtrian like i suppose every person who stays in maharashtra is maharashtrian doesn't right. have to have a marathi as a as a language could you give some examples of some of the gujarati words which are still in use yes gujarati words are not in use but uh, 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 professor vidi rao has made a whole list of gujarati words like for example uh, uh, a staircase i suddenly also call it dadar now dadar is dadaro which is a gujarati word now dadar is a local place that's a different matter but it's a gujarati word so there are so many wakan uh -huh. wakan is is a gujarati word for uh, medicine the marathi word is aushad mm -hmm. but wakan mm -hmm. so there are so many things which are there and even some of the uh, even the the sweet meat uh, like shingdi is mm -hmm. the marathi word is karanji but we call it shingdi mm -hmm. so there are these words we still use because they are, they are part of our uh, uh, the, the 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 diet of the at the time of festivity so we use that word then guravdi guravdi is a sort of a puri which is sweet now that type of a dish i have not seen in any other community being used so we do it uh, right now the shravan is going on so on every monday we have got one different sweet dish to go along with the normal uh, shravan food so we have one that is last only last monday only my wife prepared this guravdi um another question was which are the typically pathare prabhu uh, areas in mumbai uh, now they are all spread but uh, around the turn of the century that is around 1900 and even say i, I would say around 1930s or so it was thakudwar naviwadi all these things see because quite a few people were also employed in uh, government service and as you know the native town sta town started from dobitalao towards girgaon and everything which right. was on the other side was the was the british town the victorian bombay so they were staying at a you know in such a way that they could actually walk to their uh, place of work if they were employed in the government employment flora fountain was the place of business so they you uh, spent a lot of time on the sure. yeah you mentioned you spent a lot of time on explaining about the exhibitions the question was are is is that still a feature of the community does that still happen uh no it doesn't happen but community mm -hmm. such big scale on some occasion the community has been publicized so only the people from our community the community okay. members now there are more food stall the exhibits so okay. people who the non community non patel patel prabhu food stall we got particular what eat there Okay. Table anywhere in the in the restaurants, they prefer to eat. Actual uh, art work, etc., is not happening now. Mm -hmm. As a patai prabhu, I can't say that molding, but I do my own exhibition, but nothing to prabhu. Yes, such I do my exhibitions on different aspects of Bombay. Of course, yes, yes, that continues. Uh, one more question was about um, uh, no, about the Siddhis. Yeah. Hmm. Uh, 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 I'm, I'm sorry. The question is from Siddhi. Are the parabs related to the Pathare Prabhus? Hmm. 
maybe by marriage parab is not a surname in patel prabhu community okay uh, going on uh, i uh, there's a question from manisha talim she wants to know is there a link between pathare prabhus and parsis uh, there is no link but there are certain features like marriages bachelors and spinsters uh traditional okay. keeping your antiquities everything i suppose there but they okay we came from different uh, places and we came from all over north to sridhar wanted to know is but uh, there are certain traits are uh, common uh Sridhar wanted to know uh, when did the name Pathare Prabhu come into existence, or was the name used for them even when they were uh, when they were not in Mumbai? Hello. Yeah, they were. This I think named in Gujarat. They were named earlier, as I said. Patan Prabhu, Pathare Prabhu became Pathare Prabhu. So it came from Gujarat. Okay. Because we came from Patan into Devgiri. Okay. That. means prabhus from pat that is gujarati word okay so that's how it came but before that i don't think i have any idea okay how so before patan what they were so this exodus so says that because of this migration is because in more than 100 years ago even body and uh, some words from rajputana they were all there in the language reading of but gujarati words remain for a very long time interesting uh, drama which was uh, enacted called hunda dauri there is a uh-huh. old patel prabhu couple whose dialogues are in it's a very interesting uh, way to li- uh, li- i don't think that childhood i had seen the performance of, of that hindu so no patel prabhu has ever performed so it has got interesting i got uh, the text of the script of that drama interesting words and all those gujarati words are very much inheritance okay you mentioned about the exodus from rajasthan and gujarat but could you tell us in a few words about what caused that exodus well these are the things which i thought uh, were the uh, sir gives a little explanation that these are areas where not related therefore they migrate to the community from place to place because of invasions maybe because of uh, uh, some disease because of shortage of water but they they were being kshatriyas probably warrior caste they stayed at one place so there is no complete explanation but explanation from the time they came from devgiri but after allah allah devgiri ramdev rai sent in son uh, and with that this community came okay um What is the difference between Pathare Prabhus and C S K P's? Uh, Bharat wanted to know. Yeah, they are they are they are like cousins. They are part of the cousins other community of. which came along. But Pathare Prabhus are an entity itself. There is no intermarriage either. There may be some traditions etc. which may be common. The 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 slides on the water rangoli generated a lot of curiosity. So somebody wanted to know what was the material used in the rangoli. It's a powder. It's regular rangoli. Only thing is while doing it, uh, even on water it is the below the water that it is mixed with paraffin. That's what the description is. Paraffin. Checked up how that works out by asking anybody to do it. But uh, same that you get here. The powder is like the white white the. the powder of uh, um marble or something you know the next question was about how the locals like a chop okay many of the locals yeah. who were converted by the portuguese to christianity they continue to talk about their castes would you know if there are any pathare prabhu christians i don't know how many in the audience know that is ka uh, veladaris a very prominent uh author unfortunately no more on ombe a professor college she, she had told me she, the, her ancestors were pathare now okay. i don't know how she found out as what any family tree but i believe her it was possible that and in portuguese we read things either you are converted or meant an employee of the portuguese 
you are a uh, you are a rent collector etc and therefore you become uh, not popular with the local population because you collect rent and we force them to pay and uh, the one and when and we came after the british came like the owners of the prabhadevi temple Thank you.